All right, everyone. So I guess this is the last session for uh, today. And uh, what I'm going to present now is about our project, Test Enough for Automated Appendage Updates. And before I delve into my presentation, uh, does anyone actually have an answer to this or wants to attempt to answer the question here? It depends. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I think that's also, in a way, in the right direction. Uh, so a little bit about myself. So my name is uh, Joseph Hydrup. Uh, I'm a member of technical staff at uh, Endo Labs. It's a startup, but more now a scale-up uh, based in the Palo Alto in California. Uh, and before that, I, uh, I mean, I'm still actually I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, so quite close by to Brussels here. Uh, and for the last, let's say, like six, seven, eight years of my life, I've been uh, quite working on supply chain security, but also developing uh, uh, techniques that are focused on trying to uh, like apply program analysis to, for example, package repositories or trying to better understand what's going on within dependencies and dependency trees. And uh, there's sort of like a little bit talk about what I mean with automated dependency updates. I guess most of you already know what it is. Uh, so essentially, whenever there is a new release from Maven, Ruby Gems, or Cargo, or NPM, uh, you would have a tool. I just listed a couple of them, which is Dependabot, or Renovate, or DebtView. So when there's a new release in your repository, usually a pull request is created, uh, and then the let's say like it creates a branch out of your repository, tries to build it. If that goes fine, so it goes usually to the next stage, if you have that configured, to basically run the tests. And then if everything is fine, uh, in this case it's uh, showed on X mark, but imagine if everything is fine, you will merge it. In some cases, if you know it's not a problem, you would merge it in any case. Um, and I think for many of us, we have seen like you usually show something like this. Right? It will update version 2.2 to 2.4. So that's like the essential thing that I'm focusing around, like what I mean with automated dependence updates. And an interesting thing around automated dependence updates is that there's usually this promise that uh, if you just run your tests, you are essentially able to catch any type of regression errors, any problems that might exist uh, in your code. And me, as a researcher, that made me sort of a bit uh, put questioning at on because I felt like, hmm, the tests that we are usually having in our projects, they're more focused on the, your project test suite and maybe not so much on the third-party dependencies or third-party libraries that you use in your code. Uh, so that maybe sort of raised uh, three uh, questions. Uh, the first question that I asked was, uh, do we even write tests against dependencies in the first place? Uh, and then the second question is, do project test suites even cover usages of dependencies in the source code? Um, and the last one is like, are even tests sufficient alone just using tests to detect any bad updates that you might find in uh, using these tools or uh, like doing automated dependency updates? Uh, and to study this, I uh, looked into open source uh, projects. Uh, at the first, uh, oh yeah. <clears throat> and the other question is, of course, should we even write uh, tests for dependencies? Because if we like to reuse components from, the, from open source uh, package repositories, why should we even write tests for that? Because it kind of gives us the ergonomics that we can just use anything, plug it in our code, and that's it. Um, and this sort of like uh, started like as an empirical study. That's sort of what this talk is primarily centered around. Um, so the first thing that uh, I looked at into this study was to see what is the statement coverage of function calls to dependencies. And this is similar to uh, considering, for example, uh, like coverage like lines of code, for example, like Jcoco as a tool. And then the other thing that we also focus in this study is how effective are test suites in detecting updates with regression errors. So what we're doing here is that we are basically trying to find, I mean, either find or actually put regression errors in existing libraries. 
and then directly validate whether the project test suite can directly detect that or not. Uh, and that's also something called mutation uh, testing analysis, and I think there was one talk about this uh, earlier. Um, and then the last thing around the study is that currently the sort of state of art is to focus on just using uh, test, test suites, but could we use another way to uh, find any problems or uh, early detect uh, issues that might exist in updating our dependency. Um, so, yeah, the first question is like, how can we do some type of statement coverage or get an idea about what exactly are we using in third party libraries? Uh, so, we did this in uh, uh, two ways. The, the first thing was to essentially, uh, so this was of course in Java, um, we extracted all call sites that we will find in projects, and if those call sites points to third-party libraries in bytecode, we consider that as a usage. And that's for transitive dependencies, because now you're not, let's say, like longer on your source code, where you have the calls to your direct dependencies, you would also need to go to the transitive ones, and here, to sort of approximate that, so it's not an exact measurement, we essentially build static call graphs to kind of get an idea of what would be used in a uh, interdependency tree of our project. Uh, and then last, we did some instrumentation. So we essentially ran um, the tests of, the, of a project and executed what functions were invoked in the dependencies. And this will give, let's say, like some idea what exactly is being used or uh, not used at all. Uh, so essentially, first we statically derive like, you know, what are all the usages? And then by running the test, we know which of those functions were covered or not. So kind of similar to code coverage. Um, and we did this for uh, around 521 GitHub projects. And what we found very interesting was that um, when we look at to the direct dependencies of a project, so this is all the, the direct dependencies that were found, about 60%, uh, like when running the test, are, let's say, like covered by it. Uh, but then, when we go to transitive dependencies, we found that the median was only 20%, 20 uh, so which means that a lot of the transitive uh, functions that may be used may not even be re reachable uh, by test. So uh, this sort of like rings some alarm bells, right? Because that means essentially like if you have a dependency update and you don't have any test that is covering that area, that will basically give you a green tick and you might merge it. I don't, I don't think many will do that, but that's, uh, that's let's say, like the impl implementation there, and that also kind of, um, uh, yeah, raises some questions around uh, how effective using tests for automated updates. And, yeah, the other question, does this matter at all? And I think a very interesting one here is the log for shell case, because I don't think many of us would have test that is particularly targeting uh, log libraries, but here is an instance where something we don't normally would test and would have test in any case. If you would do an update, then yeah, there might be some breaking changes, then yeah, there, there will be a problem here. Uh, then going to the second part of the study, which was on test effectiveness, and I was mentioning that we're doing mutation testing. Uh, so the underlying framework we used here was uh, uh, PyTest, but we modified PyTest to do things a little bit differently. Um, and yeah, to sort of like give a quick sort of idea of what mutation testing is, is that uh, you essentially have a function, uh, for example, return x plus y, uh, and then you apply some type of mutation operator where you uh, swap, let's say, like the plus and then you would expect that your test suite will be able to cover this because here the uh, behavior is completely changed, right? It's no longer an addition uh, operator. Uh, so normally with mutation testing, you would give it your whole project source code. It will start trying to modify in the source code and then see whether the test suite is able to capture that or not. So what we did differently is that we essentially mutated functions in the dependency code and not the project code at all. And we only mutated those that were reachable by test. So I was saying earlier that we were running a test to know which functions were executed. So we used those functions to essentially apply those mutation operators. And then through there we can see 
if the test is able to capture that uh, or not. Uh, and yeah, before I go into results, so, uh, another alternative way that we investigated is called uh, change impact analysis. So uh, here we sort of leverage static analysis and specifically using call graphs. So how it essentially works is that uh, we have a version 1.02 and 1.03. We compute a diff and through the diff we will find out uh, which functions changed. And for example, here we know that uh, uh, in bar and bus function, we can see that there's an arithmetic change, like instead of y minus minus, it's y plus plus. Um, and then in the other, like in the bus function, we see that there's a new method called. Um, uh, and then what do we do later? Uh, we practically build a core graph of the application and its dependencies. Uh, and then using reachability analysis, so what we do here is that we know that the bar and bus was changed. Um, and here we have, uh, let's say, like uh, a reachable path from bar up to, uh, let's say, like stats, stats underscore JSON and main. And also we have like a bus here where we have a new function called the QX STR. Uh, and by using this, we can directly figure out if there is a code change in a dependency, whether you are reachable or not in the first place. And why this is like a very nice complement to dynamic tests is that here we are essentially leveraging by looking at the source code what are we actually using. And then as a complement to where tests might not be covering, we can sort of find directly uh, if there is any change that might affect uh, like your project. Um, then of course comes the more tricky part, which is semantic changes. So, I mean, one thing, it's nice that you can detect that a method change, but sometimes you might just do a simple refactoring that, you know, just refactors a huge method into uh, a method with, uh, like, a couple of uh, smaller methods instead. Um, so, the truth is that it's extremely difficult to know what exactly is a semantic change because there's a lot of factors around it. Uh, so, the only thing that we did was that we kind of it took what was like behavioral changes. So we looked at only like data flow or control flow changes. So for example, if you add a new method call, we consider that as a, uh, like a special change. Or if you did some mirror change on your if statements that may introduce a new logic of how the control flow works, then we consider it as an interesting change uh, to follow. Um, and what I did is like I implemented a tool uh, called Uptatera, which means update in uh, Swedish. And uh, so uh, I applied this on uh, GitHub projects and this would be the select view of it. So it essentially shows like which function had a change. So for example, rxjava.tracing subscriber on error. And we can see that it's reachable from the project and then it shows exactly how it was reachable um, yeah, through like uh, the code. And then in the second section, I would have like what is basically the major changes in that uh, function. So this could sort of give you some context of what essentially changed, other than just telling that you know, either the test passed or, or, or failed. And uh, when using this uh, mutation uh, pipeline that I was explaining. We essentially generated one million artificial updates by in introducing those regressions. And we did this on 262 GitHub uh, projects. And what we found was that when doing this sort of changes on uh, project tests, we found that on average, projects are able to detect 37% of those, which means that a lot of like uh, changes may not may get, may get unnoticed uh, like in general. But if you use uh, static analysis, now that you sort of have the whole context, uh, we're able to detect 72% of all those um, uh, changes. Uh, but what we find more interestingly here, like from the context of the study, is that there's basically no guarantees that a test can prevent bad updates. And using either of those techniques is not good enough to ensure that updates are safe. Um, then, of course, the other thing is that static analysis is not perfect. There are also problems with it as well. So the problem is with over-approximation. So 
we have over approximation at two locations. Uh, one is the call graphs themselves, because when it comes to dynamic dispatch, if there are maybe 200 implementations that might stem from an interface call, we have to link to all of them, uh, and that might generate false positives. And then the other case is also with the uh, semantic changes that we are detecting, because we also uh, don't know exactly what type of semantic change it is. Uh, but to sort of see how this worked in practice, uh, we also analyzed and applied this on 22 uh, dependable PRs. And uh, from the results, what we found in general was that by using static analysis, we were able to detect three unused dependencies. So here, let's say like the test would just pause it, whatever, but in fact, we found that the dependencies were not used at all. And we were able to uh, prevent three breaking updates uh, and one which actually was confirmed by a developer uh, where the tests were not able to detect. Uh, and then, of course, we found that there are, let's say, like false positives. And as I mentioned, there were many cases with refactorings. And then, of course, this over approximated uh, call paths. So if you use like a tool like Gupta here or static analysis, you can help to prevent updates, but then you also get a lot of noise as well as a, uh, as a result. Um, so, sort of coming to the end of more of the studies, uh, what are, let's say, like the recommendations that I have after looking into, like, uh, on GitHub projects, how tests are being made, etc. Uh, so, one thing I found missing when it comes to uh, updating with uh, test suites is that uh, we don't have any form of confidence score. And what I mean with confidence score is that, uh, for example, if we can start measuring uh, test coverage. We can see, for example, if there is a change function in a third party library, do we even have tests that reaches that or not? And that could directly give an indication whether like, my test suite is able to capture that or not. And another very interesting thing could be, for example, if you find that one of your libraries are very tightly integrated with your project, it can also sort of give an indication whether do you have, let's say, like enough tests to cover that usage or not at all? Um, and then by having sort of this score, you can maybe get an indication where does, let's say, like how well are my tests able to capture things in third party libraries or not? Uh, this is something that I would like to see in tooling in general. And then when it comes, comes to the gaps in test coverage, so this is related to the results, I was saying, like with statement coverage and uh, effectiveness. Uh, so I believe more of having a hybrid solution. So uh, where using tests or dynamic analysis is able to capture, I think we should use that because that is more precise. But then in areas of the code where we don't have any coverage, so for example, consider back to the uh, log4j library where usually I wouldn't expect there to be much test coverage. Uh, here it could be nice to complement with static analysis. So you sort of get a little bit best of uh, both words here. Um, and then another advantage that I might see having static analysis rather than running tests is that we can maybe much more earlier detect potential um, like problems, incompatibilities by having that rather than trying to run it through the build system, consuming extra resources or tests, etc. Um, so those are, let's say, like the two main things that I find important to address. Uh, and then for uh, users like myself of using this uh, automated dependency updating tools. So although like reusing is free in the sense like we can easily just use a library, but we often forget the operational and maintenance costs and those are not free. So trying to basically automate away everything by using tooling, etc., is not always the solution. I think it's important to also consider that once we start adopting a library, we also need to think about uh, how we can maintain it, but also understanding what potential risk might come from it. Could be, for example, that uh, a maintainer have a very different sort of handling when it comes to security vulnerabilities. Uh, it could also be with the release protocol, like there's, there could be disagreements on what is breaking change or not for clients. Um, so I think having that aspect is one important thing. Uh, and the other thing is like, of course, not blindly trusting automated uh, dependency updates, and I guess no one really does this. 
Uh, and then that's another thing which could be debatable uh, is to have essentially critical, I mean having writing tests for critical dependencies and this could be libraries that are very critical to your uh, project. Uh, I think here maybe having tests could help, let's say like uh, capture early issues that might arise in dependencies and not come as an unwanted breaking change later on once you uh, merge the automated uh, PR. Uh, yeah, so if you want to, let's say, like, know more about this work, uh, I have a paper. So I also upload the slides on the Fosten website, so you can click the link, and uh, the paper is uh, open access. And, uh, yeah, this is concludes my talk, more or less. So happy to take any questions. So do you know if any of these bots, like Dependabot, Renovate, are working on such a score? So let's say in the merge request you would get like a warning, hey, your tests are not covering only 10% of uh, these dependencies. Do you know if there is any work? Uh, so what I'm aware of is that there is a compatibility score uh, that looks at, for example, for a particular dependency version update, if out of, let's say, like 200 PRs, if hundreds of those were successful uh, for other projects, then it will give a score that there's a 50% chance that you will succeed here. The only thing I find problematic is that every project has their own specific use case or context of how they use it, so it could be misleading. But I haven't heard anything that looks specifically into your test suite and see how, uh, I mean, how it's able to uh, do that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the um, number of 60% for the amount of tests for uh, direct dependencies, um, and I believe it was a lot less for transitive dependencies. Do you have any numbers um, on uh, the amount of transitive dependencies in such change, uh, the, the chains, actually? Uh, so I can, I can imagine that the 60% is cumulative in these do you, do you mean for the statement coverage thing or the... Uh, the statement you, coverage, yeah, the first one you... you yeah, the fir so, so the first one, the 60% was on like direct dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, and then this 20% was on the transitive ones. Okay, uh, do you have any numbers of the amount of transitive ah, dependencies? Uh, so you can relate it to that 60% if that... Okay, so I, I did this on 510 projects, but I might have the more specific numbers in the paper. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Okay. Um, you have been looking at detecting errors. Have you looked in the other side? Because you can use it in a hybrid mode that your tool maybe can tell me you can make this update for sure because all the code is changed. You don't care about it. For example, if you look at low-level libraries like Apache Commons, you only uh, use a part of it, but you want to keep up to date. And some updates are... Um, more or less uh, completely safe because you don't touch any code that has changed because only new features have been added or so. And that would all also help if I just know, yes, that's safe. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. So that, this is a little bit the idea we had with introducing call graphs because with call graphs you can start learning what exactly is used. So even if you use like a major library and you just use maybe two utility classes, and even if you go to like a major version of it, you might not be affected by it. And this is something that should be covered by the call graph. So we would see, for example, that the utility classes, there are no changes there. But then in the rest of the package, there's a lot of changes that you're un unaffected by.
Did you check how the uh, call graphs work with dynamic dependency injection? Uh, yeah, so we'll, we, we essentially, if I understood your question right, I mean, uh, so we did generate the dynamic uh, call graphs, like running the test, and this is something that we uh, essentially use to guide or mutation, uh, let's say like testing framework to only do changes in those functions and not, for example, uh, functions that the test didn't touch because otherwise they wouldn't know whether, uh, I mean, the test suite is able to detect changes or not. Thanks.